Before we get into chapter 6 today, I want to quickly quote to you a section of Romans chapter 8. And uh, Romans 8 is wonderful. There's a big part of that is, um, is titled Life Through the Spirit. And it's the Apostle Paul um, speaking to the Roman church and to all churches through the Roman church. And he's teaching them and teaching us through them how to have life in the Spirit. And, you know, we know that uh, for those of us who haven't come to Christ, who haven't, you know, come personally to the cross and received his atonement, his atoning work on the cry- cross, his death, um, his resurrection, his ascension, and put our faith in that for our life, um, that it's not possible for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? You have to be made holy, not by performance, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, um, theologically, but really, and even before we're perfect, we become holy through faith um, to become uh, vessels of the Holy Spirit. And so in Romans 8, Paul begins to teach those who have been filled with the Spirit about how to live through the Spirit. And he is basically saying to his audience, some of which may be Christians and some of which may not be Christians, um, that there's two ways to live. Um, You can live according to the Spirit or you can live according to the flesh. Um, But he seems to be saying and making it very black and white and not gray at all at the same time that you can't live according to both at the same time. Now, some might read this section that I'm about to quote. We're not going to really read it. Some might read this section and say, well, uh, this is the difference between believers and non-believers. I don't really think so. My reading of this section is that those of us who have been filled with the Holy Spirit um, now have the capacity, though it may not be automatic, to live according to that Spirit. And we may at the same time have the capacity to live according to our flesh. And I would imagine that any of us who have been a Christian for a very long period of time, we've had days that we've lived according to our spirit, and we've had days that we've lived according to our flesh, and I bet we even know what days those are, and part of days, and maybe this hour of this day, and not that hour of that day, and so I think Paul is talking about the complexity of being in a body of death, but being filled with the Holy Spirit, having this unholy flesh, but having this capacity to have the Holy Spirit. And so he told uh, the Roman church, he spoke to them or he wrote to them, he said basically this, he said, those who live according to the flesh, according to the body and the desires and the emotions of our humanity, those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. And you might say that a large part of Jesus' audience, though they were disciples, quote unquote, Um, had decided to give him loyalty, had decided he was at least a great man, were at least fans. You might say uh, that though they were religiously compliant on the outside, perhaps even Jews, seeming to want the glory of Israel and even the Messiah to come, although I'm not sure they knew he was the Messiah, you might say even in that context, uh, even in the context that we have in church as many times as Christians, uh, we can still in that context Uh, appearing compliant and a fan of God on the outside, you could say that we're still living in the flesh and even going into church and even listening to the sermons and even going to our D groups uh, with a mind that is governed by the flesh um, on the desires of the flesh. And, and, And that church and spirituality and religion and all of that might be the means to that end. And, and I think what we see in today's passage as we go through it, and I think what Paul would say to us, that it doesn't matter. Uh, That doesn't work. And so he said, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. And he said, those who live according to the Spirit, and he means the Spirit of God, which has filled our spirit, um, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And then he goes on to warn. He says, those whose minds are governed according to the flesh will ultimately be led to death. In circumstances or in some form, uh, the wages of sin are death, right? To live selfishly, to live according to the flesh, even in religious clothes, will ultimately lead to death. But those whose minds are governed by this spirit, um, those lives are led to life and peace. And so by not being selfish, we um, do the best things for ourselves. He goes on to say that the mind governed by the flesh, um, the mind that leads us towards death, is absolutely, positively, 
those are my words, not his, but he says those, those minds are hostile towards God. Now, I'm, I'm sure some of us have been there, right? Like, we're Christians, we believe the cross, we believe the gospel, but we have those days where we wake up and we want what we want, and God wants what he wants, and they're not the same thing, and, and there's hostility, isn't there? And he says, so those whose minds are governed by the, the flesh are hostile towards God, and at least while we're in this state, and you know we're utterly in this state if we haven't come to Christ at the cross, it says that they, they will not submit to God's law. They will not submit to God, to his word, um, to what his spirit is saying to them. There is no submission. There is no surrender. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say they cannot submit to God. And he says that people who are living in that realm of the flesh, for them it is impossible to please God. And so it's, it's the flesh versus the spirit. And, and what I think Paul would go on to say in another place is that we work that salvation out of us with fear and trembling because that spirit has to trump the flesh, and the flesh doesn't like it at all at, at any time. And so sometimes it doesn't feel very good to submit um, to the spirit of God working through us and to do his will. And I'm telling you, the day comes that we break through and we find that life and peace. But in the meantime, it's not a very pleasant experience. I, I say that passage to you today as a backdrop for what we're going to read in here today. Because I think that is, if we peel back kind of the spiritual scene and really saw what was going on in the minds and hearts of people, we have those who are being governed by the spirit. And, and there are very few. And we have those who are being governed by the flesh. And yet in that, con in that congregation, we don't have Gentiles, we have Jews, only Jews. And we have people who would call themselves disciples. And we have people who have an affection or some level of respect for Jesus. We have a good Christian church. We have a large congregation. They would all have the basic same belief statement. They would probably quote the same creed. They would all love Israel and they would all believe in Yahweh. And that should be kind of a concern for us, right? Because we can submit to the same creed and we can submit to the same belief system. But at any given time, hostility between us could mirror the hostility we have between God. Because at any given time, I might be governed by the flesh, you might be governed by the spirit. But until we're both in the spirit, our hostility towards God might show up in hostility towards one another. Because the only way you have unity in a church is through mutual submission to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead. It's not a political system. We're not a democracy. We are a theocracy, and we find unity by being submitted to God and finding unity in our spirits. That's the great power we have. It's not the great possibility that we always experience. So with that said, beginning in John 6, chapter 60, with that kind of backdrop and that kind of helping to narrate and to guide our thoughts as we look into what happens here at the end of the chapter, um, we pick it up where we left off last week in verse 60. On hearing this teaching about, you know, eating his flesh and drinking his blood and all the things that Jesus was teaching that were so vulgar and unacceptable, um, on hearing this, many of his disciples, and they should have put quotes around that, but Jesus wasn't as sarcastic as me, uh, said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And, 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 and indeed, it was probably very difficult for those who were not filled with the Spirit of God, who had, did not know the things of God, who had no perception of who Jesus really was, who weren't really his. It was probably very difficult for them to even understand the crypticness, uh, the cryptic nature of what he was saying, or at least to trust that they would figure it out like some would. Um, but what I would say to you at this point is the bigger problem for those who are standing there is not what they don't understand. The bigger problem is what they do understand. And what they do understand at this moment is this guy um, will not play political ball. This leader will not come to us as other leaders. He will not pander to us. Uh, he won't attempt to exploit us, but, you know, he won't allow us to exploit him either. And we're not going to get from this guy what we want. And, and this is very hard to accept. He says things that are provocative. He says things that are difficult. He says things that challenge us. He says things that are going to take a while to figure out, and his kingdom, though it may be coming, is coming way in the future. And so they did not like the vulgarity of his message, and they certainly didn't like the temporal uncertainty of his message. 
And it was very difficult for them to accept, not to understand, but to accept the outcome that may be right ahead of them. In verse 61, uh, Jesus was aware. It says, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Now, I, I, I'm reading between the lines here, and I don't get tone, you know. I have a personality that I project upon the scriptures, but I'm seeing Jesus get a little mad here. Uh, the situation is getting a little intense. It's getting a little awkward. You've been in a meeting, right? And, it, and, and you've had people that weren't necessarily on the same page, and this is kind of how it starts feeling. They start asking questions, and they're asking for an answer, and there's a chip on a lot of shoulders. Anyway... Does this offend you? And then he goes on to say, then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Uh, before?" He says, so I see that it offends you, that you're not going to get what you want when you want it. You may never get what you want. You're going to get what you need and more than you need. You're going to get life and peace and, and, and a level of prosperity that I choose for you. I mean, God has a plan for all of our lives, and every church in America teaches that right now. Um, maybe not like we do, but he does. And the plan for your life may not be what you're dreaming. It may be instead what God is dreaming. But there is definitely temporal uncertainty. Um, There is lifestyle uncertainty to following Jesus. You cannot um, begin to hold the hand of Jesus and follow him and come with any expectations as to what the rest of your life is going to look like. He says things like, you need to pick up your cross daily and follow me. And and he makes no promises about what that's going to look like. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've I've been standing on the edge with God on the precipice, and I feel like he says, you know what? All I can tell you about what happens next is that it's very, very good, and and, and eventually you're going to love it, and you can trust me. Or you can stay back here in the level of, in your certainty. Um, but it's very clear to me that to drump, jump off the, the cliff, to, to um, trust him entirely, to surrender to him, will not lead me to my American dreams. When I'm standing at that precipice, it is absolutely a surrender of my American dreams, uh, of all of my dreams, and it is, uh, it is instead adopting the dreams that God has for me that I haven't even seen yet. Now, this isn't to say that God doesn't give us vision, he doesn't give us dreams, and and have a desire for us to believe him and to endure and and get to that place. But there's far too much teaching, in my estimation, in the American church, in this place, in this time, that, that encourages Christianity as a means to chasing your dreams. And, and that's what's happening right here. Uh, They're following Jesus as the pursuit of their dreams to be a superpower again, to be wealthy again, to be dominant in in the world scene again. And and that is not what, I mean, no, that's not the way. That's not what comes next. Uh, The greatest in the kingdom of God will be the least. The greatest in the kingdom of God will suffer the most. The greatest in the kingdom of God will be martyred. And they will be filled up with the Spirit of God and with the glory of God like never before. These men will be exalted to the place where they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. And they get to write scripture. They get to be prophets. They get to um, lay hands on people and see them healed. They get to see the great multitude come to Jesus Christ. They get to start the early church, but they also get to share in his suffering. And so you're in this scene where this is beginning to get worked out very, very early on. And a lot of people are rejecting it. And Jesus, aware of this... Uh, provokes them a little more. Uh, they, they, they are aware that their future with him is uncertain. They, they think that this thing about eating his body is vulgar, though I don't think that's the major issue at this time. And they're finding the entire, um, their entire message, which is really the gospel, they're finding it quite unpalatable, right? Like, I just can't swallow it. it it's not working too good for me. And so what does Jesus say? And, and, and this next part of the verse is, can be very um, easy um, to, mis, to misinterpret. He says, does this offend you? 
then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? And, and my initial reading of that was, yeah, what if we just see Jesus go back up and sit at the right hand of the Father in all of his glory? This would be easier to accept, right? And, and that's the surface level interpretation of this. But as I look more deeply into it and really got into kind of the literature and what Jesus was really saying here, here's what he's really saying. He's saying, if you think this is vulgar, if you think this is uncertain, if you think this is unpalatable, then you should see the process through which I'm going to have to go through to be seated again at the right hand of my Father and to bring you there with me. And this next passage is basically saying, if you think this is bad, wait till you see the cross. And and he doesn't make it any easier, does it? And and basically, he knows, and he's trying to get them to the place to understand uh, that that there there is no ascension without a descension. There is no resurrection without a death. Um, There is no being exalted without being humbled and maybe in some cases even humiliated. He knows like the, the path, the process has to be this way. If you exalt me immediately, then you are exalting the one and only Son of God to the throne of Israel and to the throne of the world. And and, and he could say to them, and we could do that, but the problem with that is this that I am ultimately entirely holy and righteous. And, and if I take that ple- place on my, jo- on my th- judgment throne right here, right now, in your presence, before any atonement, then you will all be banished from the kingdom of God. I don't care whether you're a Jew or Gentile. I don't care how many times you've been to temple or to the synagogue. I don't care how much of the Old Testament prophets you can quote or not quote. It, it won't matter because all of that is insufficient. The victory has to come through death. And that's kind of the process, that's kind of the cycle through which we inherit this life and peace that Paul was talking about in Romans. Now, how does that apply to you today? Uh, you're, I'm telling you, we're going we're gonna to have a huge church if I keep preaching like this, just like Jesus did. But this is how it applies. You've got you to gotta go through some crucifixion to experience some resurrection. I've told this story many times. I would not be standing here today as a pastor used by God to preach his word if I hadn't gone to a church and been utterly offended and insulted by the will of God. I sat in a a church service, and and, and, and there there were hundreds, maybe thousands there. It was in New York City. And I mean, the guy came out, and he started hitting us in the nose about how selfish we were, about our own American dreams, how we weren't submitted to the kingdom of God, how everything we did was for ourselves. And indeed, I was on a business trip to New York for me. And this began to insult me. This began to offend me. and, And glory to God, I stayed there long enough that I went out of the mode of, you know, living according to the flesh, and I entered into the Spirit. I got myself submitted enough somehow to begin to hear from God, and by the end of that worship service, I was weeping, and I knew that I was a sinner, and that I had to give up my dreams for the dreams of God. And, And I was right at that point, I mean, I was right at that place where I could have been like the multitude who walked away from Jesus this day, rather than the few who stayed close to his side. I'm telling you, it's the gospel, it's the good news, it's just not good news to the flesh, it is only good news to the spirit that exists inside of us. And I wouldn't preach it this deep and this hard, except that's where we are in the scripture. And if it was hard for them, then it should be hard for us too. And if not many of them could accept it, then I would imagine not many of us can accept it either. But if we're going to be true to God's word and where it has us today in John chapter 6, then we've got to put it right where it is. Jesus said in verse 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. That's hard to hear, isn't it? It's not what Madison Avenue is teaching us. It's teaching us that we should buy and we should sell and we should act and we should do according to how we feel. Uh, When we say the flesh, we mean the emotions. Be absolutely clear and certain. It doesn't mean that the, the emotions are utterly bad all the time. It doesn't mean that God doesn't ever want us to experience happiness, more importantly, joy. It doesn't mean that, that God doesn't come along and do things that put us in a good mood. It doesn't mean that we can not worship God out of our emotions, but it means that our emotions can't be on the throne because our emotions are often very, very off. And so Jesus is saying, 
the spirit, the Holy Spirit that exists inside of your spirit should be separated from your flesh, which also includes often your emotions, because this is everything and this counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, as difficult as they are to receive, as much uncertainty as they create in you in the short term, as vulgar as they may seem, they are full of the spirit and life. They are absolutely sent to you to be a blessing to you. They are sent to bring you life. They are sent to bring you peace. They are sent to bring you joy beyond all understanding. They are are sent to you to give you um, light and leadership and power. And though that is difficult to receive, uh, you need to know that whenever God sends anything your way in this era, in this time, in this space, before he returns again, it is all good. It is all grace all the time. It is a blessing. Now, that doesn't mean it remains a blessing. Our response to that blessing can cause it to be a blessing and can cause it to be a curse. It really is up to us. Our response has everything to do um, with whether it lands on our heart in the intended way. He said, there are some of you, yet there are some of you who do not believe. There are some of you who are believing and receiving and obeying and submitting. You're you're living a a life through a mind that is governed by the Spirit, and and it is full of life, and it's full of blessing, and it's full of truth. It may make you a little shaky. There may be some fear and trembling, but the blessing is going out, and it's not returning void. There are others of you, and, you know, I'll get them in a minute, but there's others of you who do not believe. And what does he mean by that? They all believed. They were all good Israelites. They were all Jews. They all believed in the kingdom of God and the sense of Israel. What did he mean? He said, you do not believe in the sense you have not given your life to me. You're still a fan. You're in attendance. You might have signed the the membership card. You might have done this. You might have done that. You might have done all this external religious compliance stuff. But in your heart of hearts, you have not given yourself to me. And the way we know this is you're about to run away as soon as I say something that is unpleasing for you to hear. You gave me your vote, but you didn't give me your heart. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. The words that Jesus speaks begins with the gospel for us. It could have come through a pastor or a preacher. It could have come through a song we heard on the radio. It could have come through um, reading the Bible ourselves. It could have come in many different manners. But at some point, for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, his words that were spirit and life came in the form of teaching us about Jesus on the cross. The, the gospel message. And, and, and when we received it, we received life. Eternal life on earth before heaven, right? Right? And in that life is the Spirit. In that Word, embedded in that Word, is the Spirit of God. And so we were atoned for and we received the Spirit of God. But it doesn't end there. It, you know, just begins there. You could say that the words that God speaks to us begin with the gospel and and never end. It's a conversation that begins with being, um, having Jesus revealed to us through the cross. And it it is good news. It is a gospel that continues with every word he speaks after that. It's, it's how we continue to live by the Spirit and His Word. It is when we come into uh, the church or we come into our quiet time in the Bible or however we um, interact with God and His Word appropriately. And, and we continue to read it and we continue um, to believe it and we continue to receive it and we continue uh, with a mind governed by the Spirit to have the capacity to submit to it and to personally apply it. Unless, you know, we're having one of those flesh days and then we, you know, we're hostile to God. But, you know, assuming we're having a good day. And that's how we live, right? Uh, It's why James 1 says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because the testing of your faith develops perseverance and it must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Because then it goes on to say, and if you lack wisdom, ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. In other words, it's the crisis that leads to surrender that allows you to open up and to receive the words from God. I'm in a men's D group, and I've been in men's D groups for years, and I've been ministering to men and been around men for a long time. And we all have the same story. Uh, We were prideful, and we were arrogant, And we were getting along in the world our way, and then crisis, financially, uh, in our marriage, uh, substance abuse, something came along, and we realized we didn't have it all figured out. And we were humbled, 
And, and, and our, you know, if we had had scriptural eyes to see what was going on, we should have considered it pure joy because that was the moment we finally um, allowed our minds to be governed by the Spirit rather than the flesh, and we received the good news and the good, wor- good word of God. And, and, and we're beginning to see that this is the kind of kingdom that Jesus is setting up. And this is the kind of lifestyle he's beginning to create. And it's one in which we have to be humble, and it's one in which we have to submit, and it's not one where we're necessarily immediately exalted and immediately made great, though one day we will be. And he sees um, that there are those ready to live that lifestyle, and there are those who are ready to reject it. He went on to say that that is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Unless you've, been, uh, you've received the Holy Spirit, then it's impossible to submit to God's law. Your mind is hostile to God, and it is impossible to please him. And that is what he's saying. And uh, this, I tell you, this passage is very troubling for us in our understanding of salvation and our role in it. It seems that one moment Jesus is emphasizing the divine act of where God is just going to go and get people and and then when you begin to become a Calvinist, as we said the other day, and then, then he emphasizes something where whosoever will respond. And so he emphasizes human responsibility. But whether uh, you're in that mode or not, one thing we do see, one thing we do understand is that um, for us to be able to receive a message like this, for us to be able to receive any message from God, requires the Spirit of God allowing us to. We can't even boast in that. It's why Jesus seemed much more concerned when he spoke and when he taught um, about revealing God rather than persuading people about God. He was very, he was very much about um, telling the truth, telling the whole truth, um, saying it with power, signs and wonders that followed, um, but there was nothing contrived and nothing persuasive about it. And I'm telling you, this comes at a very good time for me as a pastor because uh, I need his example. I need the example of, you know, Paul. Remember what Paul said? He said, uh, when I came to you, I didn't come with worldly wise and persuasive and clever words. I didn't trick your mind. I didn't tantalize you. I didn't sell the kingdom of God. I wasn't overly persuasive about the kingdom of God. I just preached the gospel simply and purely, and I preached it, and it showed up with power. And every once in a while, we gotta, that's what we have to remember, right? It's... Uh, it's coming along and being used by God, whether we're a D group leader or the pastor or just a friend to someone, and being sure that, that in love and, and with great joy um, and, and with, with absolute humility, but also with absolute clarity that we reveal the fullness of who God is because what we're looking for is to come along and to participate with what the Father is doing as he sends the Spirit. And it takes us out of the realm of worrying about being successful and more in the realm of worrying about being faithful because we know um, when God has done his part and we do our part, we ultimately have what God wants, although that does not lead to the result that we would, we would often like to see. It says in verse 66 that from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Uh, this was the moment that the blessing became a curse for many. Uh, this was the moment that uh, people overtly rejected Jesus Christ. They even kind of held him with contempt. Uh, there's a scripture that says, Paul again, it sounds like I really like Paul. It's Paul, all about Paul today and Jesus, uh, where Paul taught that um, if you received communion, if you received the elements of communion without faith, um, that you shouldn't do that. Um, because if you receive them without faith, then you were receiving them with contempt. And if you receive them with contempt, then, then the elements that were, that were given for you, ultimately symbolic of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the thing that was given to you to bless you will actually become a curse. And I should probably say that sometimes at communion. We're just in such a good mood by then, I don't want to. But it's, what he's saying is, Anything you do without faith, um, you can't please God apart from faith. And anything you do without faith, it's kind of in contempt. 
And so when you're in, when you're in, a, when you're in a place of hearing and, and being blessed by God's word and his spirit and his truth, as difficult as it may be, when you're in a place of receiving the elements of God and taking and eating, when you're in that place where grace is being extended and you're not really receiving it and you're rejecting it and you're holding it with contempt, then, then the scary thing about that is that which has gone out to, and, and was intended to be a blessing you know, can become a curse, right? It's why um, the Old Testament guy said, uh, when I speak to you today, I'm putting two things before you, life and death through obedience and disobedience. For those of you who believe it and receive it and obey it and submit to it, who aren't hostile towards God, who find a mind that's able to be governed by the Spirit of God, then it's life. And that was God's intention. That's why he sent this word to you. Um, but there's also the opportunity for death if you dis- See, I told you i get them to. If you disobey it. Uh, if you don't receive it, if you reject it, if you sit in the presence of it and you're filled with the knowledge of God, if you reject the word of God, if you re- reject uh, his commands, even if you ignore them, if you passively reject them by ignoring them, when you know full well what God is saying to you, then the blessing becomes a curse. It wasn't sent with the intention of being a curse. God didn't send his word. He didn't send his elements. He didn't send his life uh, into this world to be a curse. He sent it to be a blessing to people who are already cursed. But boy, do we become more responsible once we have the knowledge of God. And so it was a very sad day, a very painful moment. Many turned away from God. Many turned back from Jesus Christ. And, And I don't think his response was too good to that. Now, again, I'm reading between the lines. I don't know the emotions of the moment, but I, I think he was hurt. I mean, the truth is, when any pastor or any leader sees people leave, it's painful. Um, as a pastor, when you see people uh, leave your church, it's painful. Sometimes they leave for great, perfect reasons, and God leaves them away. And that's painful because you just got to say goodbye. But what is even more painful is when they're leaving represents falling away. And what's even more painful than that is when they're leaving, representing falling away, is not because of what you did wrong, but because of what you did right. When you brought a message like today, or or, or at some point told them what they didn't want to hear, when you were faithful to God's word and what his spirit was saying, and it wasn't one of those days that were all, you know, uh, candy and roses. And you see them reject that, and you see them push away, and you see them fall away. And very rarely I really know what's going on with somebody. I, I, it's between them and God. But when you sense that, that is the most painful day of all. Because you know that's the day the blessing, at least for a little while, becomes a curse until we come back around. Jesus' response to that was to look at the few who were standing there, and I think he was hurt. I think he was angry. I think he was at a place where he's like, well, you know, let's just go ahead and clear it all out. Now, we know that he, you know, never sinned in his anger. We know that he got angry, but he didn't sin in his anger because if he had sinned in his anger, he would have been like us, and he clearly wasn't like us. He was our perfect sacrifice, but it doesn't mean that he wasn't angry. And so he turned and he looked and he said, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And Simon Peter, as a kind of a spokesman for the rest of the group, said this, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where you have the words of eternal life. There's nobody who's going to tell us what to do to receive life. You are the source of every good and perfect gift. You are the source of life. You spoke the world into existence. We may not understand what you said. We may not even like that much what you said, but we know who you are, and we know what you said is truth, and there is nowhere else to go, and there's nothing else to do. We don't always understand you, but we always trust you. You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One, not from God, but of God. We got nowhere else to go. Uh, I don't think for one minute that they felt uh, uh, the warm tinglies from this message any more than anybody else did. They existed in the same carcass as the rest of the congregation. But at this point, they, they knew who Jesus was. They knew that he was good. They knew that these were his words and not somebody else's, as indeed I hope we understand today. And they knew that they could trust him even when they didn't understand him and even when they were temporarily insecure because of him. They came to that place. They were disciples. They weren't fans. They were lovers. They had given their life. They did not give their affection for a little bit of time. They gave their affection for all time. Now, there was failure still to come. They were going to have some bad days. There were going to be some days that their mind was governed, you know, by the flesh. 
We know that Paul went on to, Peter went on to deny God three times, right? Bad day, temporary weakness. But at the, at the most deep and per, important personal level, his spirit had connected with the spirit of God and he was locked in and God would never leave him and he would never forsake him. He started the work, he will finish the work. He had absolute assurance that he was locked in and this moment proved it. I mean, one thing about Peter, he was very, very good or he was very, very bad. He was either brilliant or reckless or nothing in between. Um, but indeed, his greatness came because so many things had been revealed to him from the Father. He was also the one who said, when everybody else said Jesus was a great man, it was Peter who said, uh, who, when, they, when Jesus asked Peter who he was, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Peter, because this wasn't revealed to you by man. This was revealed to you by my Father, which meant it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. In verse 70, uh, then Jesus replied, and we finally get to finish this chapter and move on with our 12 or 11. And Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the 12, was later to betray him. And so that's where we ended up. Uh, we know the difference between um, Judas and the difference between Peter. Um, though Peter denied Jesus eventually, um, Judas actually betrayed him. Uh, Peter's crime was a crime of weakness in a moment through which there was much pain and repentance, and he was restored by God. Glory to God that we do not have to be perfect and be in the Spirit every single day, every single minute, or your pastor and all of us would be doomed. Um, but there is a difference in working our salvation out over time and being in, in utter denial and in intentional betrayal um, acting as if we are one of God's people, but not willing to submit um, to his will, to his word, to his body, to anything. And so the line is drawn in the sand, and a majority go that way. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many are on it. And, you know, narrow is the path, and small is the gate that leads to life, and few find it. And that is exactly what we see here today. And that's not easy, is it? But you're still here. I don't think anybody has ran out the door yet. That's good news. But what I would say to you today, because I do believe that I have an audience before me whose hearts are filled with the Spirit of God, whose minds are governed by the Spirit of God, except when they're not, uh, I would say to you today, in your current context, and this could be a huge moment for you, I would say to you today, who's governing your mind today? And are you being driven along by desires and ambitions and dreams that emanate out of your flesh? Or are you being carried along and led along by the Spirit of God who is making His own promises and letting you know what His desires are? Uh, are you in a place where you'll accept whatever God has for you regardless of what it is because you know He is the Holy One uh, you know, of God, not from God, and you know that His words are life and eternal life, and you know that ultimately it leads to life and peace? Are you, are you there? Or are you at a place where you're tempted to walk away from God because He's not going to give you what, you what you want? And that's what this chapter is all about. Am I going to go to God and receive what I need and what he has for me? Or am I going to go to God and demand what I want? And, and our response to that has everything to do with whether we can continue in our journey with Jesus Christ. And a few people passed the test and many, many people failed it. I would say to you today, who's governing your mind? Who is filling your heart? Is it you or is it him? And then I would say to you today that if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, but let him in, surrender to him, submit to him. Do not let the blessing of this chapter, do not let the blessing of this message, do not let the blessing of this day become a curse to you. Uh, you can walk away angry and hostile and unsubmitted to God, or you can break in his presence and submit, and you can bow to him, and you can be filled with the Spirit and walk out of here and find a brand new day. Uh, do not harden your heart if you hear him speaking. Uh, open it up and allow his word today to truly, to deeply, to powerfully bless you. Don't let the blessing become a curse. Don't stone the messenger. 
to do that sometimes. I don't like it. Um, but receive the word of God because it is his word. And I can promise you this, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says, and my wife and I, I mean, we quote it all the time to keep us alive. I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. There is absolutely a wonderful reason you still exist, but there is a very, very good chance you have no idea what it is. It's as if we as a church are standing at the precipice and he's saying, are you ready? Are, are you willing? Are you able to take the leap? You don't know anything that's going to happen next. You just got to trust me that it's good. That's where these men were. And after all these years of following Jesus Christ, that's where I am again. I mean, just yesterday, I felt like God gave me that metaphor, not just to preach to you, but for me. He was saying, Brian, we're there again. And you've done this once, and you've done it twice, and you've done it three times, and you always think that you've arrived, and you don't have to do it anymore, but you've got to keep doing it. This side of eternity, you're going to have to keep doing it. I want you to do it again, and I'm doing it again. And what I'm asking today is, are you ready to leap with me? Our response to that has everything to do with whether chapter 6 of John will end up being a blessing or a curse in our life. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you and praise you for the way you speak to us through your word. We thank you and praise you that you've created an environment for us to come into you and uh, come into and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you and praise you today, dear God, that we did not have a pep rally. We thank you and praise you, dear God, we did not come into an environment today where we had to act like everything was all right. We did not come into an environment today where we, we had to say all the little religious colloquialisms and, I don't know, Christian idioms and all the silly things that we say to make people think that we are blessed, 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 and everything is great. We came into a place where we could be broken and hungry and searching, even yearning, dear God, and that we can worship you in that place. We thank you and praise you that you have met us in that place. And you have not left us alone. You have sent your word and you have sent your spirit. And I don't think for one minute today, dear God, that this word and this, this message was just a general message for Monterey Church today in, in Virginia or California or Maryland. I think this was a message for the individuals, for every single person. I think there is a personal application uh, that your spirit is putting on every single heart and in every single mind. Jesus, we affirm you. We glorify you. We come along with, with um, Peter and we say that we believe. Matter of fact, we know that you have the words of eternal life for us. And we believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. We submit to you. We bow to you. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done, not to take over and dominate the world yet but to take over and have dominion in us. Glorify yourself through our church and every single member of it. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.